on really what you're seeing, what, what are the hottest topics out there as far as issues? Well, I think obviously the big question that we're getting a lot of is, you know, how, how do I register? What's the process? And we're trying to work with the health department to make sure everybody understands um, all the provisions, the rules that are in place, and and hopefully get everybody to be patient. I know there are states like Arkansas and Ohio that passed this two years ago, and they still have not rolled it out yet because it, it's taking time to, to get all the, the, the procedures in place. But I can tell you, talking with our colleagues in those other states, after two months, Oklahoma is further ahead than, than most of the states were at this time um, who've gone down this path. Some of them, Oregon and Colorado, who, or California, who've had this for over 20 years. Um, so we're asking people to be patient with us, and we're working with them. From a law enforcement perspective, you know, obviously our, our role will be most, much the same way it is now with, with any other type of drug, uh, especially pharmaceuticals. If people are not abusing it, they're doing it right, whether it's the dispensers, the manufacturers, the wholesalers, or the users then they've got nothing to worry about. But we, we don't want to be seen as a safe haven uh, for this to, to take on the life of its own. We want people to look at Oklahoma and say, this is a state that's doing it right. Um, and that's why we are, we're, we're working with our colleagues in other states. Part of the beauty of, of being the 31st state is we're not cre recreating anything here. We've got other states that we can lean on and learn what worked in their state and what should we avoid here in Oklahoma um, such as the concerns of you do, you've got to have some regulations in place so that you don't have criminal elements coming to your state and flying under the radar, as we've seen in other states, and they're rare instances. But you'll have groups that will come in and they do all the paperwork and think that uh, nobody will recognize them because they've got, on the surface, it looks like a legitimate business, but then they're selling it untaxed, unregulated, uh, larger amounts than, than anyone would ever think was reasonable amount to be selling and on top of that they're hurting legitimate business uh, or dispensaries or wholesalers or Oklahoma processors who are following the rules they're trying to get everything in place and and then they're getting hurt because their stores are empty because everybody's buying it from some fly by night company out of town uh, so we want to make sure that we're doing it right another good example would be CBD oil Oklahoma's had CBD oil uh, legalized for three years here in Oklahoma there's a lot of legitimate businesses but I can tell you from my experience in the last three years at Real Narcotics, we've had to deal with several who, um, for want of a better term, are, are doing more harm than good. Um, they're, they're, we're getting calls from people who say, you need to look at these stores. They're, they're not following the rules. They're selling things that are completely illegal in the state of Oklahoma. And they're hurting those CBD stores that are doing everything right and, and even potentially risking patient health as well as uh, employees who are potentially failing drug tests because they bought something they were told was legal and THC free and now their job's in jeopardy. So we want to, we want to have this, the same, I think that the same spirit with medical marijuana and that is if you're doing it right, we're going to help you do it right. We're going to protect those who, who are uh, trying to follow the letter of the law, but those we don't want to be seen by outside elements to say, hey, go to Oklahoma because they look the other way. They're so busy, they're so swamped that uh, we can fly under the radar. So. We've, we've got some of those issues that we're going to work out. We're going to work with the campus community, the health department, certainly our legislators to make sure that we do this right. Uh, from a law enforcement perspective, obviously, we've got a lot of issues we're concerned about. We look at Colorado, we look at California, Washington, Oregon, and some of their issues are things like driving under the influence are, are much higher in, in states that have legalized it, whether it's medically or recreational. We've got to address that. Um, you know, some of the packaging with edibles, there's been some overdoses and, and kids and things like that getting involved in, in edibles because there weren't proper labeling. We want to make sure that if people are going to have edibles in their home, that there's safeguards in place to make sure we protect kids. Um, extractions of, of hash oil, or what we call concentrates, the high THC, which is a very volatile process. And those of you from Oklahoma are familiar probably with our meth lab situation. For 20 years we fought with the fires and contaminated properties. And, we, we want to make sure that, that if, if under 788 they can have the concentrates, but we want to make sure that they're doing it safely. And so uh, we're going to be looking at maybe some, some legislation to help deal with domestic manufacturing of hash oil so that it doesn't end up seeing like Colorado and Oregon that have had to go back and strip some of those laws because of fires and explosions and, and certainly property damage to people in this room I know will be very interested in. Same with indoor groves. Um, you know, we've had experts say that some of the contamination from an indoor grow is worse than the contamination from a meth lab because of the toxic mold, the fungus, the spores, and other things that can make people sick and, and a lot of move in. They grow marijuana for two or three cycles and then they move out in the middle of the night and the landlord comes and checks his property 
and said it was cheaper to, to get a bulldozer and a dumpster than it was to remediate the property because of the mess left behind. So again, we want we want to make sure we're not penalizing those who are doing this right, but also not be a safe haven for people to, to harm others. That, different things catch your ear as you hear more and more about uh, the development of, of cannabis and, and, and the legislation and, and the need for it. Uh, and the unfunded mandate that everybody's asking for. Um, but, but one of the things that caught my ears about this debate probably a little over a year ago, um, I was having a conversation with somebody that, that knew, and, and you'll quickly agree, I was actually looking at your presentation that you sent to David as we all prepared for this panel yesterday at David's office as we're getting ready for the new semester, but uh, something to the effect of, um, and this is from over a year, it might, be, it might be two years ago somebody told me this, but modernly grown uh, marijuana uh, from, from Mexico or, or in, in from certain growers um, has THC levels that are 50, 60 times higher than uh, what was available or, or used back in the Woodstock days, you know, of the, of the 1960s. And, and, and that's something that people aren't really aware of. I don't think that your common citizen is aware of that. Uh, so so, so the, the marijuana that actually, that's actually being grown and used today is, is 50, 60 times stronger than what you think of as traditional marijuana that was used, you know, in, in, in the history of Americana, um, Woodstock, John Lennon, and those, those older days. Uh, talk a little bit about that real quick as far as issues that that's, that's burgeoned into the... Absolutely, how many of y'all have grown up in Oklahoma? You, you ever heard that the, the same marijuana is our, our number one cash crop? It used to be kind of a joke about they had in treat t-shirts in McCurtain County Gold, and everybody wanted McCurtain County Southeastern Oklahoma to grow marijuana. Because we did a lot of things well in the 1980s, and played, including, I tell people, we played good college football, we know how to grow good dough. We had traced Oklahoma grown marijuana to 22 other states and four port cities. They weren't sending marijuana to Oklahoma. We were a distribution state. Uh, people wanted ours, and that marijuana, the reason they wanted it was because it was so powerful, and it was hitting six to seven to eight percent THC. You can go into a dispensary right now in Colorado and get 28% THC, no questions asked. That gives you an idea of what we were seeing in the 80s compared to the marijuana today. When I was telling you about the THC concentrates, the, the, the pure THC oil, there's companies that can extract it, and, and they can make it to, to fit a patient or, or a customer's preference, but they can also basically cook it to, to the extreme. I mean, there's competitions to see who can grow the, or who can extract the strongest, and there's companies that say there's a 99.9% .9 THC. So again, like I said, in the 70s and 80s, we were hitting six and 7%, and people thought we had some powerful stuff on the streets of Oklahoma. You're now hitting 99% in, in some of these companies around the country, and you know they're having competitions to see who can be the last man standing to, to smoke it, and, and I mean, it, it incapacitates, and you start seeing people have seizures with, with, when you get a certain <coughs> concentration level. So you're absolutely right, we're, we're, we're dealing with marijuana today, through science and technology that wasn't even out there five years ago. And it's, it's, it's in some ways about compassion, but you also have to understand this is also a market-driven industry. In Colorado, for example, if you're in competition, and I think as of April there were 427 dispensaries, how do you compete with 426 others? You better have the best product out there. And that's why they're looking for science to help expand, to get the best strains out there, to get the strongest concentrates, the most unique products. And so they're always looking to kind of one-up the competition down the street. And one of the ways they're doing it is upping the THC levels. Um, and that also is to meet the demand. Because when, when the longer your duration of smoking marijuana, the quicker your tolerance is. And that tolerance level will keep going up. And so we, I talked to people even before, uh, as late as 2008, when we started seeing some of these uh, hash oil fires. Why, why were you manufacturing hash oil when we already had 20, 30% THC hitting the streets of Oklahoma coming out of California? And they said, because some of my clients don't get high from 30% THC anymore. They're needing 40, they're needing 50 or 60 just to get to the same point they did five years ago with, with 15 or 20%. So again, you're also trying to meet the demand of the market. And, and so they will do that. But we don't want them doing it at home and in apartments and hotel rooms next to families when they're just watching a YouTube video and they think, oh, I've watched a few videos, now I know how to do it. They go out and get some butane and some other ingredients and on their kitchen stove, they're trying to extract it before you know it, they have an explosion. We, we've seen a couple of those here in Oklahoma. And, apartments in Colorado. Right, right. We had an apartment across the street from UCO and Edmond uh, in 2013. The guy blew his kitchen windows out from uh, cooking. And he, he had severe burns, but nobody else was injured.
everything that you're talking about and as we move you know, towards the right here on the on the table uh, the spectrum the things that you think of in the back of your mind are you know as i've talked to reputable brokers here in the marketplace about what they've seen uh, as far as uh growers you know a, a, a need that growers have for some industrial growing space some of that space is going 50 60 dollars a foot for you know class c industrial space which is just it's just off the charts uh, and, and at a point you know you, you try to figure out how the market's going to support uh, that sort of a demand or are those costs from those proprietors trying to operate at that level and actually turn a profit? What factors is, does that bring into play? You know, in, in my mind, you know, I worry about uh, the illegal side, uh, you know, people fly by night coming in, undercutting people that are trying to do illegally, you know, at those sorts of uh, expense uh, brackets, um, you know, and, and what could happen, you know, just from, from, a, from a social element. You know, if you could, if you could be undercut, which isn't hard to do when you're paying that much per foot uh, for industrial uh, space, then you know that there are other factors, not just from a law enforcement uh, side. But I want to get down to Chris Cotner. Chris. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, I think when they they wanted to do this panel today, they said we need to have an attorney come talk maybe about the business aspects of medical marijuana businesses, but. What we need him to look like is that he is vaguely involved in the cannabis business himself. So we need to have moderately long hair and a beard. So I think I fit the bill. So as, as I was listening to a uh, presentation uh, from, from the OBN and, and thinking this morning also about some things, the truth is, is that this morning, all of us, some of us in this room, uh, imbibed a product that had a psychoactive agent in it. We may have even had some more lunch. Um, there was a psychoactive agent. If after lunch you might have stepped outside to smoke something that had a psychoactive agent in it. Um, this some of you may have children who you give uh, Adderall or Ritalin to in the mornings that has a psychoactive agent in it, methamphetamine. Um, and so, and then some of us over the weekend enjoyed. Uh, a product that has a psychoactive agent in it, my favorite being bullet bourbon. So the truth is, is that uh, whether it's medicine or recreational, uh, the United States has been using products legally and safe that have psychoactive agents in them for 100 years or more. The problem with cannabis has been, and I find myself, I guess, as the accidental cannabis advocate, that I didn't set out to do this, um, and my sweet Southern Baptist mother would probably be horrified that I was talking to you all today. And now it's going to be in the paper. And the <laughs> That's right. Uh, Where the state be? What? Where the state be? <laughs> so, um, is that a lot of the bad side effects uh, that have been talked about, I think are more related to the, to the idea that because cannabis has been considered a controlled dangerous substance since the 1930s, there has been no medical testing available. No science has been available. It got put into a class of drugs that it doesn't belong into, which is, uh, you know, it's classified with things like cocaine and heroin. Cannabis is not in any way, shape, or form re related to those drugs. Well, I'll call your mother. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. And, and, and if you want to get into the roots of it, which we don't have to do today, there's actually a, a bigoted element related to cannabis being made illegal because it was coming from Mexico. Um, and so marijuana was a, was a derisive term used for that type of cannabis, and that's what ended up making it illegal. So all the bad things are because we don't know what it would look like to actually have medical cannabis available. And so the dosages, the THC limits, um, you know, what, what would be a safe THC limit for somebody who actually needs it to control their pain? That's kind of a hit and mess situation. So I say that to say that there, Oklahoma's at the forefront of bringing some of this back. Um, and, I, and I'm glad to see it. From a business perspective, um, what everybody needs to understand is that the possession, consumption, use, or sale of cannabis is illegal under federal law. Okay? That's it. That's what you need to know. Possession, use, consumption, or sale of cannabis under Oklahoma law is legal. And as long as you do it in conformance 
and I'm glad that, and I, I know the OBN's position to be helping, and, and, and I appreciate that. Um, but as long as you do it in conformance, it, 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 I, I can maybe give you advice on, on how to comply with Oklahoma law. But the consumption use sale um, of cannabis at the federal level is illegal. And that has certain consequences that I think housing will talk about. The two main ones that you need to be aware of for your communities that can be fixed overnight is number one, cannabis businesses will not have access to banking. So they are barred from using payment transaction systems that normal people use. Um, presumably I could even pay, pay to have somebody do a criminal act with the square. Um, but, if, but if I use the square to sell uh, cannabis, I don't have access to those payment systems. That's an illegal transaction. So without access to banking, then you have large duffel bags of cash. They're gonna to have to be dealt with. Cash will be used to purchase, cash will be used to pay sales tax, cash will be used to, to buy things, so you're gonna have people transporting cash from their dispensary to a grower to pay for an invoice. Because they, they can't write a check, they can't use your credit card, and they can't use your debit card. That's dangerous. It's crazy. It, it's unbelievably dangerous. Um, and, and, it's, and then the second aspect of it is related to taxes. So cannabis, because it's a controlled dangerous substance, if I were a, an assassin, um, IRS doesn't care how I earn my income, it just wants me to report it. Um, there are some caveats to that, but for the most part. <laughs> there, there's some Fifth Amendment issues related. <laughs> But if, let's say, I, so I'm an assassin and I, and I make a million dollars gross proceeds because I'm really good at what I do. I can file my taxes and I can deduct costs related expenses related to travel. I can do it for the bullets that I purchase, for the guns that I buy, for anything that might be considered a legitimate business expense. I can deduct that from my gross and then file taxes on the net and pay taxes on it. Is this still all hypothetical? <laughs> hmm? Is this still all hypothetical? This is all hypothetical. Hypothetically speaking. <laughs> but, if, but if I have a cannabis business that is legal in Oklahoma or Colorado or some other states, uh, in 1981 or 1982, uh, as part of the war on drugs, Congress passed or the, the authorized the IRS, and the IRS has a regulation called, uh, it's commonly known as 280E. And what it says is that normal business expenses cannot be deducted from the sale of a controlled dangerous substance. So we're going to have Oklahoma, good Oklahoma taxpayers, paying a 60 to 70 percent effective tax rate on their uh, on their gross uh, from their cannabis businesses because they can't deduct those expenses. There are some potential workarounds on that. I don't encourage those, but the, um, but but effectively, um, you can only deduct cost of goods sold. So for growers, that's a lot. For processors, that's a little bit less. And for a dispensary, that's essentially the wholesale price that they're going to be paying for the cannabis at that level. And so you've got, you've got cash in the streets, and you've got an inability to deduct business expenses. And I think you know there could be a perfect storm of things. But the main thing is you've got Oklahoma taxpayers and residents who, if a, if a US attorney here in, in either the Western, Eastern, or Northern District decided to try to make a name for themselves, could be prosecuted tomorrow. And there's not anything we can do about it. There's no way to protect them. Um, so, that's my, there's way we can talk about the different businesses, but it, it, and, and they've made it very easy to apply with some restrictions. My favorite one is that um, if you are a cannabis business, you have to account every month for the prior month's inventory. And if your inventory is short, you have to account for why your inventory is short. You have to give a detailed narrative explanation for why last month you had this, your sales report this, which would indicate your inventory should be X, but it's actually Y. So where did the other stuff go? Every month you have to file that report along with your sales tax reports. So there are some good, there are some good things in place. I'm, a, I'm an Oklahoma. Uh, commissioner, real estate commissioner, and I just want to be clear that I can't speak for the commission because we just haven't gone there on this stuff. I'm also the president of a, of a realtor association, and I can't speak for them either on, 
on this subject because we just don't have any briefings on it. What I'm going to talk to you about is my opinion, okay, as an academic. That I can do. Um, and so the things that I'm going to tell you are the way that I understand it and the way that I'm currently going to practice it in my practice and what I'm recommending to others. Um, that could change uh, because it is a, it's a fluid uh, market. I made a list of a couple things uh, that I'm watching and that I'm concerned with. Uh, the first one is compliance, and the second one is disruption. And I'll talk about compliance first. The, the problem we've got is, is, is just like Chris uh, talked about, we have to stay in compliance with both federal and state in almost everything we do in real estate. From the loan that we get, I can guarantee you the loan that you signed will, t will say that you have to stay in compliance with federal law, okay? If you, if you participate in this marketplace, you're not, the way I understand it. And so we have a compliance issue when it, when it comes to from state to federal. Um, so I worry about that for mortgages. Uh, one of the things that I'm, that I'm concerned about is uh, title insurance. Um, you cannot get title insurance if you have on a building that has uh, this activity going on in that building. That's my understanding, okay? So, and, and, and let, me, let me just jump in. And the reason why, that David's exactly right, the reason why you can't get title insurance is because the title insurance company doesn't want to underwrite a risk that might be jeopardized by federal enforcement. Right now, uh, the supremacy clause of the United States Constitution says that, stop, that states can't pass laws that contravene uh, federal law. And of course, we've done that along with 37 other states. Um, and so, uh, that being as it may, uh, for title insurance to be written on that sort of project, uh, it jeopardizes the Fed that's coming in, waking up one day, whatever that might be in the future, next week, next year, next five years from now, uh, and coming in uh, and, 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 and seizing that property. And then the title insurance company doesn't want to write that, they, they would not. That's why they do not write title insurance on that use of land. Okay, so what does that mean practically? So I own a building. And I had somebody call me and they wanted to do a marijuana operation in my building. And I just said no. Okay, I said, I'm just not going to lease to you. And the reason is they want a long-term lease because of the equipment that they want to put in the facility. I'm not going to do a long-term lease on that building because then if I choose to sell the building in the future, I can't sell the building. Because I cannot sell that building without title insurance. Because you got to get, in order to get a loan, you have to have title insurance. Probably the person couldn't get a loan buying it anyway if that operator is in the building. Okay, so that's a problem that we're concerned about, is how do we do these transactions if these operators are in the buildings, okay? So that's one uh, that we're concerned about. Uh, insurance companies. Insurance companies have issues with these uh, facilities providing insurance to them as well uh, because of the same reasons. The secondary thing is just what you were talking about in Denver. I went to the University of Denver and when I was at school at the University of Denver, I was working on my PhD, and that's right at the time that this was all going on there. So I got to kind of experience it real time there. They had a, a, a significant spike in explosions in apartments, and I, I wrote it down, and it's basically uh, condensing marijuana into a concentrate with, with, uh, butane. with butane. You would, you forgot more than I'll ever know about it. but. That's a problem, and these insurance companies are well aware of it, and so they're 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 really looking at these at these policies now to see what who the tenants are in these policies. So we look at that. On a property management standpoint, one of the things that we worry about there. Um, I used to be a large Section Eight landlord in my property management company. It is my understanding that every document that I've ever signed with them basically says that there can't be any use of control and illegal substances in the residence. It's my understanding that those are federal. And it's my understanding that if I have a Section 8 land, uh, tenant that's utilizing these materials in the house, that that would not be legal, okay? Uh, again, we have a compliance issue. It's legal in the state, it's illegal in the federal. Uh, which one is gonna trump? Um, Another one. So with uh, the Fair Housing Act and somebody having a disability that requires medical marijuana, would you be violating the Fair Housing Act if you turned them down because of your federal law? 
My answer would be no. That's my personal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering which one's which the other one. So. The lawyers are probably being. Well, I, I think the answer is no, you're not, because it's not recognized. It's still, a, as long as it's a Schedule One controlled dangerous substance, it, 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 then nothing changes. Okay. So until that changes at the federal level, then nothing changes at the state level. It has to change at the federal level. Yeah. To go down to, yeah, it had to be reclassified probably as a Schedule Three and or they, there's a bill, uh, Corey Gardner and Elizabeth Warren, if you can imagine two more disparate de uh, people, Colorado Republican, uh, Democrat from Massachusetts who have a reverse preemption bill currently that they've introduced that says that the bad stuff that applies at the federal level uh, won't apply in states where marijuana is legal. Where now the, the pro and it was introduced in the Judiciary Committee. Um, problem there is we have a Supreme Court pick coming up, so the Judiciary Committee is kind of busy. So I don't imagine there'll be any any movement on anything like that for a while. So sorry. Okay, so. Uh, let me talk about just on a practical standpoint from a property stand, property manager standpoint. If you manage property, and I know that there's a lot of people in here do because I recognize some faces, you get calls about barking dogs. You get calls about people smoking, smoking on their balcony. Um, you get calls with people smoking in their house that literally goes through the walls. And I'm, I'll guarantee you every property manager in here has gotten a call saying, my neighbor's smoking marijuana. It's driving me crazy. I got one last week uh, in Edmond. Uh, a college student was smoking dope, and the guy next to him is not a college student and has had it with the smell of dope. And I, I can only imagine um, that that's going to increase, and that's going to become more of what we do on a daily basis is trying to control this thing. So I'm just going to tell you in my leases, the way that I'm handling it, it's, it says in my lease currently that you can't smoke anything, and you can't vape anything, period in anything that I own or I manage. It's gonna stay that way. And I think that I am legal. I think I have a legal method to do that even after it's, even if it's medical. I don't think that I have to allow them to smoke in my residence. It's generally applicable, yeah. Now, on the edible side of that thing, I think I might have issues if I start, if I try to prevent them from uh, taking an edible. And I would, I would uh, give that to the Chris's to see. But I'm going to leave the smoking in there, and they're not going to be able to smoke in or around the facilities. It's just too big a nuisance to the other tenants. Um, so that's how we're going to handle that in, uh, in my business. Growing it. It says right there in my lease that you cannot grow it. Uh, will, we be, will we be able to maintain that? I don't know. Um, again, I would ask these guys their opinion, um, but I think that we can. I think that they're uh, particularly indoor I think that the, the, uh, the evidence from an academic standpoint is significant enough to say that there is enough damage caused in moisture and black mold from growing marijuana indoors that I think that we will be able to prevent that if that's what we want to do as landlords, okay? That's David's opinion, okay? I don't know if the law is going to back me up on that um, or not. I'll ask Chris and Chris those questions. but. Um, but right now, that's sort of my thing. Also, as a landlord, if they start growing enough of this stuff, um, what we've seen, one of the telltale signs if you're a property management landlord, if somebody's growing dope in their house is what? Electric bill. Electric bills go through the roof, water bills go through the roof, and you can tell uh, that something's going on in there. And uh, so that's a telltale sign that's happening. If that's a telltale sign that's happening, and you're paying utilities on one of these buildings, your expenses are gonna increase. Um, so those are some of the things from the compliance thing that we worry about. Um, let me say something about the disruption. And, and Chris kind of led to this when he talked about the, uh, the industrial. The retail in Denver, which I'm most familiar with because I was there and I tend to be there more, um, there's over 400 uh, dispensaries there. About three quarters of those, or maybe even a little more, are medical. Um, there's 111 McDonald's and Starbucks combined. Okay, there's 80 Starbucks, 31 McDonald's for 111. And there's over 400 dispensaries. That is a huge disruption to the retail. That's even in our capita. market. That's a, high, that's a high per capita. Yes, even in our market, if you watch what's going on right across the street from my house in Edmond, there's a building there that had been empty for over three years. 
And I told my wife, watch, it's gonna be a, a dispensary. And sure enough, the sign's up, um, it is. Uh, so they're filling a lot of space in our retail market. Is that good? That's great. Uh, unless you're on the buy side, right? Unless you're, unless you're trying to rent. Uh, because we think that it's gonna have a, a, a positive effect on rent values. We think they're gonna go up. Uh, just because we're gonna increase occupancies in those sizes of strip malls. So let me say, last thing I'll say is, is on, uh, on uh, industrial is probably the most intriguing to me. And the reason is, uh, for instance, in Denver, there's 589 uh, marijuana growing facilities, 4.2 million square feet of industrial space. Okay, that's 4% of all the industrial space. That doesn't sound like a lot, 4%. Until you consider this, it's 40% of all C and D properties. So here's the good news about industrial space for marijuana growing. If you have low ceilings and bad dock heights, you have a problem in industrial. It's not very good for most uh, current day distribution efforts. But with marijuana, low ceiling heights are great because you don't have as much room to heat and you know, it's just, it just works better. And so they really like these facilities and they're filling these facilities and they're paying premiums two to three times market value for these properties there. So it's had a really big effect uh, and a disruption, I'll call it, uh, it depends on which side of that you're on, whether it's positive or negative. So those are the things that we look at from a real estate standpoint uh, and the concerns that we have in property management.